praise the Lord. Amen. I love I love that singing because it just it goes so well with the message, you know, when when things are going bad is when it's difficult to say it as well, right? And despite when whatever the news may say, despite whatever the doctors may prognose, despite whatever tomorrow may have for us, the ability to the right ability to say it as well with our soul. And it's because, by the way, it's because we keep our eyes on Him. The author and the perfecter of our faith. I don't know if any of you have ever um, had the joy and privilege of actually preaching a funeral. Um, I know that sounds awkward to some, but I do find it a joy and a privilege to do that. um, To be involved in that. I don't know how, I I know most of you, especially in the South, that you have, been to a funeral where there was something done in the church, uh, the building where we gather, or it was done uh, at the funeral home, <clears throat> and then there was a second part done at a graveside. They call it a graveside service. You ever done that, where there was two of them, uh, both at uh, a gathering where a sermon or something was done, and then we all moved graveside. And as a pastor, you have to be careful, because you don't want to re-preach the message that you just preached or the sermon that you just did, but you want to be brief want to be brief, but you don't want to rush it. So it's this, it's this uh, conundrum that you find yourself in as you're preaching it. So normally what I usually do when I'm at a graveside is I read a passage, typically from uh, Thessalonians, uh, a passage of Scripture, and then I pray. Um, and it's very simple, it's very brief, because I believe that uh, the sermon has already been preached. Um, and as a matter of fact, in the prayer that I say, one of the things that you will normally hear me say in this prayer um, I actually got from a great pastor by the name of uh, uh, Criswell. And one of the things that he actually prayed, and I, I thought, man, how beautiful this is, and, and you'll hear me pray this if you've ever been to a graveside, is, Dear Jesus, all that hands could have done, we have done. All the words you have given us to say have been said. So now where we leave, we ask that you take up and take care. All the words that have been said has been said. All the things that we could have done, we've done. Now we ask that you take up and take care. And this is what we will see in our final message this morning. Um, if you've been with us, and, and this is hard. I text Jay this week and I said, I'm kind of depressed. And she says, what's wrong? And I said, I'm finishing Amos. I've enjoyed the series so much. I've enjoyed being in the Word and in this so much. Seeing some something of God that we typically don't see. And it's when God... Uh, his, his, his mercy has run out. His patience has run out. And now the most merciful thing He can do is actually come in vengeance and come in justice. And that's what we're coming to this morning. It's the final message. We're at the graveside of an entire nation. God has given them time and time again the opportunity to repent. He's given them opportunity after opportunity, message after message. They have refused to listen to Him. And now here we are. The funeral message has been preached and now here we are at the graveside and we are going to witness a funeral procession for an entire group of people. But the funeral is not the end. As a matter of fact, one of the passages that I typically read is from 1 Thessalonians. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, you'll know the passage. And if you've been to a funeral, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But this is the passage that I read. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are fall asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And he goes on, and then in verse 18 it says, Therefore comfort one another with these words. Because when you're at a funeral at a graveside, the last thing you want people to do is to leave the graveside depressed. You know, I mean, the funeral is depressing enough, but for those of us who are believers, when you're doing the funeral of a believer is we are not to grieve as those who have no hope, but we are to grieve as those as, as though God is going to redeem this in some way. Because why? Because we know it is well. Right? Because our eyes are on Him. Because He moves the wind and the waves. And, and no matter where, what happens in our life, He is with us through the, through the 
fire, right? He is with us through the storm. He is with us through whatever we are in. So when we go through these times of grieving, we can do that. So this funeral that you're going to read this evening, uh, this morning, is not an end, but yet it is uh, merely the instrument of transition. Necessary, necessary, by the way, for God to accomplish His redemptive plan. And that's what we've got to understand about death. <clears throat> for those of us who are believers, that death is not an end, that death is merely an instrument of transition from that which is temporary to that which is eternal. And that is what we are going to begin to see. And our death, your and I death, is, is merely an instrument in the hands of a great Redeemer. So if I were to die tomorrow, God willing that that is not the case, because I kind of like what I'm doing, and I think I have some other things going, uh, plans that I have made, but you know, we ought not to take that for granted. But if God were to take my life tomorrow, I want you to know that that's an instrument in the plans of God, in the hand of God, that my Him taking of my life is not, is not the end of my life, it is merely a transition, is an instrument of transition from this temporary world to the eternal. It is merely walking behind the curtain, so to speak. And death is the curtain. Sure, you know, I think most people fear death because it's not really what happens after death. It's the instrument of death, right? It's the, and it's brief. It's brief. So this morning, we are going to look at a funeral that will end with the hope. The hope of God restoring things. And I think when we get to the end of this, I hope that if you read this and you go, what in the world is going on here and what is going to happen, I hope you get to the end and, and by the time we're done with this message, you can go, ah, that is so so wonderful in the way Jesus does these things. So turn with me as we look at our final message, sadly to say, in the book of Amos, as we look at Amos <clears throat> chapter 9. I do have to be honest, as I was preparing this sermon series, Amos chapter 9 was, was originally four, four different sermons. Um, but then this thing called Christmas snuck up on us. And then we had this thing called a hurricane. I had to do some adjusting very quick when we had to make those changes. So let us read Amos chapter 9, the entire chapter, which is only 15 verses. 15 verses. Amos chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and He said, Smite the capitals so that the thresholds will shake and break them on the heads of them all. Then I will slay the rest of them with the sword. They will not have a fugitive who will flee or a, refuge who will, a refugee who will escape. Though they dig into Sheol, from there will my hand take them. And though they ascend to heaven, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide on the summit of Carmel, I will search them out and take them out from there. And though they conceal themselves from my sight on the floor of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it will bite them. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword that it slay them, and I will set my eyes against them for evil and not for good. I wonder how many people's theology is totally messed up right now, right? Really struggling with that verse. Hopefully I can provide some clarity. Verse 5. The Lord of hosts, the one who touches the land so that it melts, and all those who dwell in it mourn, and all of it rises up like the Nile and subsides like the Nile of Egypt. The one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. He who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord is His name. Oh my gosh. You think He's making a point? I do. Verse 7. Are you not as the sons of Ethiopia to me, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord? Have I not brought up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtar and the Arameans from Kerr? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Nevertheless, this is the key, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For behold, I am commanding and I will shake the house of Israel among all nations as grain is shaken in a seed but not a kernel will fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people will die by the sword, those who say the calamity will not overtake or confront us. In that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches, and I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who, who does this. Behold, 
Days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treater of grapes will him who sows seeds, when the mountain will drip sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Our most high and sovereign King, we come before you. And our desire is for you, God. That our minds would remember you. That our bodies would obey you. That our hearts would love you. Father, we come before you as a people who are not ignorant of the fact that our iniquities are great. And we are totally inadequate to save ourselves. But we also know that if we were to come to You, God, that You are rich in mercy. The blood of Your Son can cleanse us from all sin. And the agency and the, the power of Your Spirit can subdue and overcome our lusts, our desires. That God, we would not come into this place without that reverent reality of who we are and who You are. So God, we come before You this morning asking for Your Word to pour upon us as a new fountain of living water. That Your Spirit would indwell us. and That God, You would motivate Your people to be Your people. Would we, would we be Your people in this place and would Your Spirit draw us? Draw us to who You are and what You've done. So that we may know who we are and what we are to do in light of it. Would you be glorified in all that we say and do. For it is in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. For six chapters. Six long chapters. Y'all are with us, right? And God spoke very directly through the prophet Amos. If y'all are with us in chapter 7, you know that God began to change. He began to change the way He revealed Himself. And what He's doing here is for six chapters, He spoke directly. And then for the remaining of the book, God only speaks here. Uh, he changes His method of communication. And then He began to speak in visions or pictures uh, to describe what He is doing. In the first two, Amos speaks more than God. Y'all remember this? Let's go back to, you don't have to turn there, but just in, verse, in chapter 7. Amos will talk about this locust swarm and then he will go into this, uh, this fire that will consume them and then this, this wall that comes. So in the first two, what we see is Amos speaks more than God. And then in the second one, we actually begin to see uh, that very few words, matter of fact, the next two, very few words are spoken by the prophet. There are no... And then here in the very fifth and the final picture that God gives... I want you to notice that Amos is totally silent. There's no word that you hear from him. In the first two, Amos is actually in communication with him, actually saying, hey, will you forgive them? Will you help them? And then God says, yes, I will relent. Remember this? And then the plumb line was set, and God was saying, here, here, this plumb line is set. And then Amos is like, hey, I don't, there's very little I can say. And then we got last week where we were in this basket of fruit, and then Amos, now we have God questioning Amos. And Amos is very very brief in that passage. And now here we have God speaking and there is no other word to be said. We have now come to the funeral, ladies and gentlemen, of an entire people, of an entire nation. And what God is about to say is unequivocally destructive. And it is when man stands before God, when God speaks, it is when man needs to be silent and just listen. God is about to speak and now the time has come for man no longer to plead. There is no introduction. It's not like God's going to... Remember in the, in the previous visions there was this introduction. There's no introduction. There's no interpretive key. There's no, there's no God saying this is what this means and this is what that means. No, there, it's pretty... It's gonna pretty he's going to put it out there. Right? So there's no, no introduction, no interpretive key. There's no intercommunication. There's no Amos, listen, what do you think? And Amos, this, what do you have? No... The time has come for silence. 
And it is merely God revealing Himself to His people in the final word, in the final time. So there are four words that I have used that are going to help us get through this passage as we end this fascinating story. Here are your four words to help you kind of notate as we go around this. The first word is destruction. Destruction. The second word is explanation. The third word is interrogation. And the fourth word is restoration. Destruction, explanation, interrogation, and restoration. First, in verses 1 through 4, we will see absolute destruction. Where does Amos see God? Standing by the altar. Now this has significance. Number one, he's standing. What does that mean? That God is coming and he's saying, I have the authority to do as I please. Number two, he's standing by the altar. What was the altar? The altar was the place of communion with God and His people. And it is the place where communion with God is assured upon sec acceptable offerings for their sins. I want you to think about this. There is a bigger picture here that we will get to later. But here is God about to, about to present to them their funeral. And he, he could stand anywhere He wanted. He could stand on the mountain. He could stand in the temple. But yet, where does He decide? He could stand anywhere in the temple. Where does He decide to stand? He decides to stand right next to the altar. As though all the things that could have been done for your sins have been done. It's been accomplished. Now I'm going to speak. And now you will need something to overcome this sin. There is something that has to happen on this altar, ladies and gentlemen. There is something that's got to, there's something that's got to give because the time for their confession and repentance is over. And here He is. Standing by the altar. The place where believers come and experience the glory of God in their midst. And here is where they will hear the words of the Lord. And it revolves around the theme that we have heard through this letter. And it is this. There, and hear me, hear me. I say this with a very sensitive heart. With a very sensitive spirit. But this is one in which that I preach to myself 15 times before I ever preach to you. And it is the truth. It is a truth that no matter what the preachers of today want to avoid and to escape from, no matter what preachers don't like to preach about, it doesn't cease to be the truth. And it is this. There is no escape from divine retribution. Please hear this. There is no escape from divine retribution. There will not come a day that you will able, you will be able to hide yourself from the presence of an almighty sovereign king, God himself. And here we have in verses 1 through 4 what a picture of complete destruction. He smites the top of the pillar so the threshold shakes. I mean, this is almost like, I don't even remember the, the movie, but it was, it was a movie when you hit that, uh, I think it was Popeye. You remember Popeye the movie with uh, Robin Williams? And there was this guy with the big old neck, and he stuck his head out, and somebody hit him on the head, and his neck would pinch in, in his collar. Anybody remember that movie? No? Okay. Sorry. Um, but he, it's a power where God comes in, and He smites the top of the pillars to where it shakes at the very threshold. Like a, almost like a bolt of lightning or a, Something that comes. Now it's not, listen to me, this is important. Notice how he describes it. It's not from the ground up. It's from the top down. It's God saying, boom! And the whole body shakes in its presence. And then, and then it all comes down on top of the people. Some are going to try to escape. They're gonna, and when they try to escape, they run into the path of the sword. That's, what ha that's what's happening in verse, in verse 1, right at the very end there. They will not have a fugitive who will flee or a, refuge who, a refugee who will escape. I will slay the rest of them by the sword. Death by natural causes in verse 1. Death by human causes in verse 2. All at the hands of God's punitive reality. None will survive. There will be no hiding place. Verse 2 and 4 are illustrative for us. 
What do you think he's trying to illustrate for us in, in verses 2 and 4? The idea that you think you're going to find a hiding place? Well, let me show you where I got you. You think you're going to go down to Sheol and get saved and, and, and have salvation there? You don't think I can find you there? Oh, I'm going to get you. Oh, you think you're going to trick me and come up to heaven and I ain't going to be able to see you? Oh, I'm going to see you. You think you can hide in Mount Carmel? Come on now. You think you're going to go into the bottom of the, of the sea and I can't find you there? Anywhere you go, I can find you. Does this not sound eerily familiar to Psalm 139? Let me turn there. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but I'm turning to Psalm 139 if you want to write it in your notes. In verses 7 through 12, listen to this. Verse, uh, Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, it says, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there you will, your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what I'm saying is that there is no place to hide. The dreadful reality for some of being in the presence of God. The dreadful reality of being in the presence of God. I used to find it humorous, now I find it quite disturbing. When people in the church talk about going to heaven and standing before God as though He is going to have to answer some of their questions. I, I'm not, I, look, I'm not, I'm not judging here. I just think, I think we've lost the awe of God in the church. And hey, by the way, if the church doesn't have an awe for God, I can guarantee you the world's not going to have an awe for God. I mean, when we're at work and we're sitting there and people are talking about God and they're talking about this and then you make us, we as the church make statements like this, well, when I get to heaven, I know I got a few questions for Him. Bro, let me tell you what, when I get to heaven, I'm going to just bow before Him and just pray Pray to God that, hey man, God, you are God, you are sovereign, I am yours. Oh God, thank you for redemption, thank you for salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we need to raise God's sovereignty. And when we raise God's sovereignty, guess what we find ourselves doing? Kneeling. Which is exactly where we ought to be. The idea that God is sovereign over every possible place is what it means for God to be omnipresent. God is omnipresent. He is present in every place. He is present in the past, the future, and the present. He is present. He is omnipresent. He is always present. He is always present. <laughs> now, now, for some of you ought to be in awe, right? I think we make an error when we teach God is not present in hell. That's what we teach. God's not present in hell. Oh, yes, He is. God's there. Now you've got to listen to this because this is where it gets biblical and where you've got to understand if God is not present in hell, God ceases to be omnipresent. Because there is a place where God is not. And that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says that He is everywhere. By the way, we take this word for Sheol in the Old Testament and in the New Testament we direct that towards hell. Right? Now I could go into a whole description of what's going on here and I don't have time for this, but listen to me. You may be, and some of your theology is just thrown out the window because you know, we've been told, we've been taught, you know, God's not present in hell. Oh no, He is. Here's what it is. Where, what is the difference between God's presence in hell and God's presence in heaven? Because He is in all places at all times and to remove any of that from Him would make Him cease to be God. Here it is. God's presence in heaven, His presence is the presence of blessing. He is in the eternal sense of blessing. So when we get to God's presence in heaven, we are in the presence of His blessing. But ladies and gentlemen, His presence in hell is the presence of His wrath and His judgment forever. So He is there. And He is pouring forth His wrath. And that's the only thing you'll ever see. In hell, He is only present in His wrath, not in His blessing. And for those, for those, I have good news. 
Oh, I have good news for those of us who are in His presence through blessing, through, for those of us who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, for those of us who understand why He stood by the altar because somebody had to die on the altar because we couldn't do it ourselves, because we too were rebellious in our, in our trespasses and sins. When we get to heaven, Paul has a good word for us. For I am convinced of what? I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and praise be to God. So you may be asking, why is God's wrath on them in this passage? Well, if you've been with us, you are aware, but Amos reminds us in verse 4. He says, and though they go into their captivity before their enemies, and from there I will command the sword that it slay them, and I will set my eyes against them for evil and not for good. He's reminding us it is because He has set His eyes against them for evil and not for good. It is a serious situation, church, when God's people refuse to seek good rather than evil. Remember chapter 5, verse 15. That's verse 14, excuse me. That's exactly what it says. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gates. But when people, when God's people get that wrong, when people in general get that wrong, they can expect God's gaze upon them to bring about evil and not good. Now listen, here's another thing. Why? Why could that be an expectation? Here it is. Remember last week when I told you this, and if you don't know this, the sermons will be on the internet hopefully soon. So what I want you to hear is this. Here is the point. There is two answers to one question. Whose will? It will either be you saying to God, your will be done, or will God be saying to you, okay, your will be done. So here it is. When God sets His eyes against them for evil, He is going to, he is going to remove His hand of good. And I can guarantee you, when God removes His hand of good, what is the direct end, uh, result? Evil. This is another thing I find quite interesting in the church. How we like to talk about how good we are. Especially grandma. Grandmothers love to talk about how good their children are or how good their their grandchildren are. I I know, I know, know, I've heard this. Boy, I've heard this. I've had grandmothers come up to me after preaching something like this and they go, oh, you don't know my grandchild. (laughs) Let me tell you, honey, I do. (laughs) And the Bible does, and the Bible declares that they are buckets of sin. Okay? If you don't believe me, don't feed them and find out how they react. Right? If you don't believe me, try, try getting a little three-year-old that uh, uh, Nick's not here. By the way, our youth, our students are at Camp Victory. We need to keep them in our prayers. Nick and all the students are there. They're having a fantastic time. Nick was telling me just this week how Leland, Leland, the little little bitty Leland, looked at him and said no. Now, do you think Nick and Aubrey have ever taught him to say no to them? You ain't got to teach that. It's in, no. Oh, I'll show you no, all right. Right? Here's, Here's what I'm trying to say, ladies and gentlemen. The only good that is in us is because God is good. The only good you see being done in this world is because of God's common grace. If God removes His hand from a people, you will see the result of evil. Brokenness, wickedness. The time has passed now here in this passage for lessons. The time has passed for pleas. The time has passed for repentance. And the time has passed for conversation and dialogue. And the time of fulfillment has come. And now it is destruction. Verses 1-4. through four. Verses 5-6, through six, we go from destruction to explanation. And I love this. Just in case you didn't know who the Lord God was, He's about to tell you. Right? Just in case you didn't know what He was capable of, He's about to give you a little insight. So we go from destruction to explanation. Reminding the people of the God whom they have refused to obey, by the way. You want to know why I teach, whenever I teach how to study the Scriptures, that the very first thing that you need to learn when you go into the Word is who is God? 
It is because we can get, we can take the Bible and then we use it as an instruction booklet, as though it was meant to be an instruction booklet. Now listen to me. Yes, this has instructions for us on how to live, but it is first and primarily the revelation of God to his people. So first and foremost, we better know who God is. Because if not, watch what happens. We get very tricky with, the, with practice. Because when you distort the image of God, you can do whatever you want in practice. But when you have a good and right image of who God is, practice will automatically flow from it. Is everybody with me? Identity gives us activity. And if you don't know who God is, you then become confused on what God does. Watch. And when you get confused on what God does, you then get confused on who you are. Hence, I'll tell God something. And when you get confused on who, who you are, you then get very confused on what you do. Hence, let me tell God something. Right? So we first come and we go, whoa, who is God? And this is what He's doing. He's telling them, you refuse to obey me. It did not cease making me me, God says. I'm still God. And this is a hymn, by the way. This is a song glorifying the majestic power and the authority of God. The I wills in verses 1 through 4. Listen to me. The I wills in verses 1 through 4. They're not bravado. They're not bluff. They're not metaphorical. They are God saying, I have the power and I'm going to do it. You watch. What God said will happen, will happen because He is Lord. The one who touches the land so it melts and all those in it mourn, it rises and falls like the Nile. Remember last week we talked about this. The Nile is the greatest, uh, the greatest um, uh, natural catastrophe that the people in that area would know. It would be like me saying the hurricane, hurricane 5 came on... Uh, came, uh, Katrina came to our Gulf Coast because we understand hurricanes. If you try to take the language of hurricanes and go explain it to Israelites, they might be like, I don't know what you're talking about. But they know about the Nile and it's rising. We don't know about the Nile and it's rising, right? You ever seen the Nile rise? I've never seen the Nile. I ain't never been to the Nile. Now, I've been in denial, but I've never been to the Nile. You with me? And what he's saying here is that the God who reigns over all of heaven and creation is the Lord of all. The Lord is His name. Yes. So we move from destruction, from explanation, and now we go into interrogation. Verse 7. Watch the questions. God is about to ask questions. This is so Job-like. Remember how when Job came before God and he starts saying all this and then God goes on a two-chapter rant of just, oh, oh, well, put put on your big boy pants and come with me. That's kind of what he says. Where were you when I made the stars? That's what he says. And this is what he's doing here. Watch what he does. It's interrogation. as though It's as though Amos and God are answering an anticipated protest. What is the anticipated protest? Think about this. What would a people who believe they are God's people say from a prophet who they are not expecting to prophesy any prophecy against them? Why? Because they're God's people. The audience is rejecting the message because they are God's chosen people. And God says this, you stake your hope on your relationship. And then they are reminded that they are no more important than the Ethiopians. Verse 7, you are, not as, are you not as sons of Ethiopia to me, O sons of Israel? You think Israel is angry? It would be like me saying something in the American culture. America, you think you're special? God has His hands on, on, on Iran also. Right? So before you think you're special, hold on. Let me pull you back a little bit. This is basically what's happening. Amos is saying, you are no more important than these remote people. And before you say we are the people of God rescued out of Egypt, which is what they would say, oh, no, 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 see, we're the people of God. And then God says, hey, the Ethiopians are mine. But, but wait, He rescued us out of Egypt. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, well, He rescued the Philistines and the Arameans too. See, God is saying, your gracious rescue. Oh my goodness. If I can speak to my brothers and sisters. Listen to me, church. If you think that your gracious rescue on behalf of God 
constrains God, you are dreadfully wrong. Your gracious rescue on behalf of God constrains God in no way and provides no protection for you for judgment. In one statement, God is snatching away what? Their nationalistic pride, their social smugness, their military security, and He is saying none of this matters to me. Make it clear to you. Remember in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2? Let me make it clear to you. Your special relationship doesn't remove responsibility. Your special relationship is the very reason for your punishment. Israel's election, Israel's elect status does not excuse their sin and it does not make them superior people. Their election was purely by grace giving them the responsibility of revealing God to the nations around them, which what what they have obviously not done. Pastor, what about nothing can separate us from the love of God? Well, this is where 8 8, 8 through 15 comes in. We're going to get there, okay? Stick with me. So we have been through destruction. We've been through explanation, interrogation. Now we're going to end on the end of the book ends with restoration. So here's Amos. He's announcing all these uh, uh, destruction, all this destruction. And then he adds this, but not totally. Did you notice that? Verse 8. I will not totally. As he announces, he adds this. For me, this is the apex of the chapter, if not the apex of the book. It has been one of utter futility until he writes, Nevertheless, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. Although Israel will be desolated, the house of Jacob will remain. God says, I will uphold my covenant promise. Who will they be? Those, look, who will they be? Those whom God sees and sifts. The, this is, the, he does two things here, right? First, it sifts and it traps the undesirable stuff. The husk, the stalk, or in this case, the sinners. And not one pebble will fall to the ground. Now listen, most commentators see this as not one sinner will escape. Which I agree, because they will be discovered in the sifting. But for me, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to indicate that not one of those who are truly His by faith will fall. Not one of us who are truly His by faith will fall. Despite the sifting. He will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. He will not leave a kernel, a pebble, fall to the ground. All the sinners among God's people are destined to be by the sword. This indicates two things. God will use nations around them to sift, but not all that are sifted or destroyed. What will God do to them? The day of darkness will be replaced by the day of light. In the days following His divine judgment, there will be a day of hope to come. In light of all this message of judgment, we discovered what? Another idea of God's manifested grace. God is sending Amos is indicative of God saying, I'm not done. If God was done, He would have never sent the prophet to tell Him He was done. Why did He send the prophet to tell Him, you're not doing what you should be doing, I'm done with you, and I got some, I got some other plans. What are those other plans? This is what He's going to talk about. There will be a day when God will raise up the fallen booth of the tabernacle of David and wall up its breaches and rebuild or raise up its ruins as in the days of old for the purpose of possessing the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by this name. Notice here, notice the expanding reality from the booth of David to the remnant of Edom. Did y'all see that? He starts with the, in verse 11 with the booth of David and then he reaches out in verse 12 and that they may possess the remnant of Edom. These days are sure to come when they will do something and something will happen. Amos here uses agricultural activities in verses 13 through, uh, through 14 roughly. So he's using these old... Now for those of us who are urban or suburban and are raising, we may struggle with what's going on here. But for those here in this agricultural community, they would get it. They would understand what it means. So let me help us understand it, okay? The plowman and the reaper and the treader and the sowing are all pictures. 
They're all pictures. There's a plowman and a reaper. There's a treader and a sowing. So stick with me. Plowing begins early in the year. Usually after the first rains, which is about October or November. Reaping would happen in April and in May. One would then come in after they reap and they would press the grapes in August or September. And then they would plant again when? November and December. Do you see the rhythm, the seasons happening here? So what is the prophet saying? Let's read it. Just see what you're seeing. Verse 13. Behold, days are coming when the plowman will overtake the reaper. Whoa, 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 whoa. What, what's he saying? What is this? I just went over this whole idea. What is he saying? He is saying that one is plowing. While one is plowing, one is reaping. While one is pressing, while one is reaping, one is pressing. While one is pressing, one is planting. It's almost as if there is a simultaneous harvest happening all the time. It's almost as if every day is the day of salvation. It's almost as if God is always adding to this new group of people the hope of what's to come. It's always as if something is always happening with God. He's always going to be up to something in this day. New wine will drip from the mountains and the hills will be dissolved. There will be no one in want for God will bring it about. He will restore the captivity of His people and they will, not, and they will never be ever, they will never ever be rooted out again. In this time there will be a permanence to their forgiveness and the restoration of His people. Now, so we come and we ask the question, when is this going to happen? Because this is where this is where all the questions come in. And I can honestly sit before you and say I could be wrong in my assessment. Man, I read a lot of commentaries on this one. Is this Israel's reappearance in 6 BC after they were exiled? Remember, Amos is preaching 40 years later, they're going to be uh, they're going to be overtaken. Israel and Judah both will be overtaken. Y'all with me? And then they will come back. That is what the book of uh, Nehemiah and Ezra are all about. It's them coming back from exile. Is this what he's talking about here? Or is it Israel's establishment in 1948 as a nation? Israel was practically destroyed. They came together in a miraculous way, really, in 1948, and they became a new nation. And Now, is that what he's talking about? Or is it some future event? Is it a future event where we're talking about the end times, when Jesus is going to return or when God returns? And I, I've read, I've read the comment, and there's, there's good excuses and good reasons for all of them. And there's good reasons that all of them are not true. And the way I usually interpret Scripture is the very first thing I do. I try to do is I allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. Allow the Word to interpret the Word. So is there any precedent for us for Amos 9? Is there anywhere in the Bible where Amos 9 would be used to help describe a situation? And I have good news. There is. Turn with me to Acts chapter 15. You want to hold your put you want to keep your finger there, by the way, if we turn back and forth. Acts chapter 15. Turn with me to verse 15. I'm going to be reading verses 13 through 18. Now, what's happening here? The council of Jerusalem. Jesus has risen. Acts, by the way, is the act of the apostles, the act of the church. The council of Jerusalem has basically come together because they don't know what to do with Gentiles. Can Gentiles be Christians before they Jews? What's the question? Do Gentiles have to become Jews before they become Christian? Everybody with me? Okay, this is what's happening in Jerusalem. Why? Because it looks like the Gentiles are receiving the same thing Jews received and, and, and the Jews, some of the Jews are a little upset over this because they're going, wait, they have to become Jews before they become Christians. So there's this whole argument going on, and you can read that for yourself, not time for this. And, and so then James is going to speak, and listen carefully in, in verses 13. It says, after they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After these things I will return. I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen, 
and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. Does that sound familiar? Amos chapter 9. So, let's go back now. James is saying that these verses are not a fulfillment of a geographical Israel in the past or the future, but these verses are, it, it, it is found in the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus that the fallen tent of David has been revealed. So, who is Amos referring to? No, no, no. Us. The church. We are the fulfillment of this process. When God is taking a sieve and shaking His people, who is He referring to? Us. We are to proclaim that the purposes of God are not anchored in any nation. It's not anchored in any civilization. It's not anchored in any geographic location. But the purposes of God is anchored in His church. Nations will come and go. Amos lets us see that even though we are surrounded by such trouble and trials, that no matter what may come, that God's plans will ripen and unfold and He will fulfill His purposes in us. Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, you've got to see this, guys, because if you don't, you'll get confused when you begin to read this. Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. Watch what he says. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, upon them and upon the Israel of God. Who is Paul talking about in Galatians as being the Israel of God? The church. It's us. It is the church to whom God says we are now to go make disciples of all nations. And who is the one who is going to do it all? God is the one who restores. He's the one who builds. He's the one who plants. He's the one who blesses. There's no political, no social, no military revolution. It is the coming of the Lord who will heal His people and their land. Therefore, we are not, we are not living lives of complacency and pretense but in the reality of Christ's power and His resurrection. Living as the writer of Hebrews states, longing for a better country, a heavenly country, longing for a better home. God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. Like, let the fearful look around. Oh, I got a word for you this morning, I think. Let the fearful look around. And if you are fearful today, I guarantee you that's what you're doing. You're looking around. Looking around at all the things around you, wondering what in the world is going on, and you're living in fear. You have sheltered and shut your doors to the world because you are so scared. Parents, Scared to death of things in this world. Let the fearful look around. Let the pessimists look down. Let the pessimists look down. Always looking down. Always humdrum. Always, no, we can't do that. Always, well, you know it's illegal. Always, well, you know we can't. Oh, just pessimism, pessimism. It has infiltrated the church today. We look more like this. Oh, let the fearful look around. Let the pessimist look down. But let the believer look up. Thus nothing can separate us from the love of God because it is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what do we see? What do we see? Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Faithful forever. Perfect in love. 
Don't miss it. God, you are sovereign over us. For the God of Amos is the God of who he has pledged himself to be, the God of his people. And who God pledges himself to be, the God of his people, he will be their God from yesterday, today, and forevermore. What a marvelous ending to such a destructive book. To know this, that God was speaking to Amos so many years ago, and he looked down and saw me as being the fulfillment of that promise. Oh my goodness. How beautiful is that? How awesome is it to know that we who are His will forever be His. I come to you this morning telling you this. The balance of what has been preached this morning has been complicated and difficult. But it is this reality that none of us, no not one, will stand before God Not one of us will stand before God and not give an account. So what you going to say? You think think you're going to stand before God and go, hey, look God, I did all this thing on a scale. I did some good things. I did some bad things. I did some pretty good things. I think my good outweighed my bad a little bit. You know what God's going to say? Your error was in two judgments. Number one, I'm a holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth declares His glory. And you think that that little sin didn't matter to me? You forgot who I am. And the second thing He's going to say is this. You made the mistake in thinking it was on a scale and not on law. Because when you stand before me, it's not whether how many things you've done good or bad, it's whether you've broken the law. And I will tell you this, there's not a person who can hear my voice right now who has not broken the law. Including this boy. I'm going to tell you, let me tell you what I do. <laughs> I, I, what's the song say? You know, I don't know whether I'm going to stand or fall or all this. I don't know. I hear, here's all I know. If my hope's in Jesus, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Hey, look, if Jesus is not standing before me in the courtroom of God, then I have no hope, y'all. All All my eggs are in the Jesus basket, for I believe that He, standing by, by God the Father, standing by the altar, was saying, this has to happen. There has to be a restoration for you. There has to be redemption. There has to be blood shed for the penalty of sin and I believe that Jesus shed that blood perfectly. He lived the perfect life. He lived the life I couldn't live but died the death I deserved to die. Stayed in the grave three days just like He said He would and He rose again as the amen and the receipt that God's payment is what? Paid in full. Tetelestai. It is finished. And I give you good news this morning that the hope that God gave Israel is the hope that I give you that you too can have salvation. For today is the day of salvation and it can be your day of hope. And for those of us who are His, we come in here and we are honest with ourselves. We open ourselves up like a chest or drawer where we don't want anybody to see. But no, we open ourselves up like a, like a closet and we go, look in, look in me. Because there is nothing in me that God will not redeem and restore. Look in me, I know I am broken, I know I am in need, but oh, I can tell, I got good news. He has redeemed me, He has saved me. So when we look at a passage like this, we can know that we are not those people because we have not avoided the truth of a thrice holy God. No, we see it every day, the fact that we fail and we fall, but yet we come to Him in repentance and faith. And by the way, church, listen to me. If you can live your life every day and never be in repentance and faith, you have either a shallow view of God or you have too good of a view of yourself. I tell you to repent and believe. I tell you to repent and believe. So that's what we're about to do. We're going to respond.
For those of us who are believers, we come to Him in repentance and faith and go, God, we know that You are good and we know that You are great and we know that You're gracious, so here we come. We come before You in repentance and faith. And for those of you who are lost, I call you to salvation. For those who will confess with their mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that He was raised from the dead, you too this day can be saved. Let us stand. Father, we draw near to Thee this morning because You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our thanks. God, I thank You that You did not leave us without hope, but Jesus, You came and died on the altar for our sin. That God, we come now in this place realizing, Father, if I am right in this passage, then we are we are the people who You promised to Amos and to the nation of Israel that You would use to restore. Oh God, may I be that people. May I not be a man who Amos looks at and says, you're the one. <laughs> but God, may I be a man who Amos looks at and says, yes, there is one who is living in accordance to the hope and the, the promise that Jesus has given us. Father, I pray that if there is one in here who does not know You as Lord and Savior, that today will be their day of salvation before it is eternally too late and they will no longer be able to stand in the presence of God's blessing and grace. But they will stand for eternity in the presence of His wrath and judgment. Draw us near to Thee as we worship You in Jesus' name.